Before joining Stone the Crows, drummer Colin Allen had worked with Zoot Money and the legendary John Mayles Bluesbreakers. Colin had been pleased to get the chance to work with John Mayle. Well, I mean, one of the big attractions was he was going to America. You know, I was dying to go there, you see. So, um, yeah, it, it was fun. I, uh, and you see, the thing that most people don't know about John's band is he never rehearsed. He never, I, when he called me up, I, I've been uh, in, in, in Stockholm with, uh, with Georgie Fame, where I met my now wife. Um, and, um, and I kept, get back and there's a phone call and, a, and, you know, John, John was always big on like recording bands when they didn't realise it kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I'll be some, listening to some tapes to you. I think you could be good in, in my band. I said, I said, yeah, that would be, I, I'd, I'd like that, John. And, he, and I, I said, uh, when do we rehearse? He said, oh, we don't rehearse. <laughs> and that was basically, I mean, one of the first gigs, I think, was a running festival. He, he shouted across to Mick Taylor, Oh, Mick, start something up, uh, a shuffle in E or something like that. And that was uh, the way it was with John, which was great, actually, because he just, you know, one of the great pleasures, of course, of playing with John is he never told you what to play. You just played, which is wonderful. What were the sessions like for the male album Blues from Laurel Canyon? What do you remember about recording that album? Well, it was recorded in three days and mixed on the fourth. That, that was it. I, 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 I mean, uh, prior to work with doing that album with John, which is the first thing I did with John, I didn't play with him before we did the album, I was, um, I was playing the Stockton Fiesta Club with Paul Jones. Uh, Chris Spedding was on guitar, one or two other people, and, um, and I remember that I thought, oh God, I'm going to be playing with John next week. So I used to, <laughs> I used to put my drums in the in the dressing room and practice playing shuffles. You know? But um, yeah, that last well, I came down. I had the I had the Monday off, I think, and Tuesday we went into the um, studios at West Hampstead. And three days, fourth day, mixed and out. You know, as you were playing with the teenage Mick Taylor, I mean, how impressed were you with this playing? I, you know, I I was never a blues fan in terms of like buying blues records so I, I really um, I was uh, you know coming from a jazz background playing with Zoo I was really into soul music and Otis and James Brown and those kind of things so I really hadn't thought too much about that style of, of guitar playing you know but obviously yeah I mean, he, he was he was great and he still to this day remains my friend and I did a gig with him about a um, year and a half ago in in uh, in, um, in in Belgium the festival because I see him when he comes to Stockholm I always go down and say hi, you know. So how did you become part of Stone the Crows? Uh, I just finished with, um, with, with Mail, and of course I come back, okay, now what am I going to do now, blah, blah, blah. And um, I knew Alex Harvey, as most people did, and, um, and he mentioned me to Leslie Harvey. And uh, I get a call from Mark London, who was the, uh, became the manager of the band, and uh, went over and met them, and uh, sure, yeah, that'd be interesting. So off I scoot in my Mini Cooper S to Glasgow, <laughs> shitting bricks because I was so worried about all the things I'd heard, you know, don't go on Sucky Hall Street and all that stuff. So yeah, that's what I did. I went to Glasgow and, um, and, uh, and met up with them there and uh, that, was, that was it. Now what is it you enjoy about playing with Maggie? Why, well, she's so much fun to work with. I mean, I'm realising that now with the British Blues Quintet because, I mean, she's got great rapport with the audience. She's always up for a laugh. She's got a great sense of humour. And, and apart from her singing, which, I mean, you just don't have to really worry about it. She sings and that's what she does, you know. It's the same with, with, the, with everybody in the band. They just do their thing, you know. But, um, now yeah, we've been friends for a long, long time. We, we, we've got a lot of memories and... Um, and, and, and to be back playing with her again, probably in the last band I'll ever be in. <laughs> um, you no, know, she's just a great lady to be with. She's a great singer, you know, what more can you say? I mean, how do you rate her as a vocalist? Oh, she's obviously one of the greatest, like, you know, blues artists or blues singers or whatever. But uh, she can sing anything. This is the whole thing. She can sing traditional old Scottish songs and then go into, like, you know, <laughs> blues stuff. And, and, and so she can... Because of the, the, what she's come through, you know, singing with the dance bands and all that stuff, she's not just the, she, you know, she, she's done all the stuff that people like Ella Fitzgerald would have sung, and she's, she just knows all these different types of music, as do I, because I came through all different kinds of music, you know. Now, do you think that first line of the Stone the Crows is probably the, the best musically? It's funny you say that now, because I've seen 
videos of that band playing and I enjoy that music more than the second band it, it was more well I mean most people would term Stone and Crows as a, a, a progressive rock band which I suppose we were because uh, in that day you know, those days it was kind of you know oh, let's do something in an odd time signature and oh Jesus Christ you know but we yeah we did those kind of things um, uh, after John and Jimmy were, uh, uh, left the band um, it became uh, not so different in some respects. It became just more like a rock rock band, uh, really. Um, now that first band, they would definitely play some interesting stuff, you know. What, what were your memories of, of the manager Peter Grant? What were your memories? Oh, well, big Peter. What can you say? I mean, he was a pretty imposing kind of guy, you know. Um, but as I say, we didn't really have too much to do with Peter because Mark was really our, our manager as such and um, Peter just was involved in helping you know obviously for like helping sort out record deals and uh, and, and touring especially in America because we, we went there a couple of times but um, that lovely guy Peter you know one of rock and roll's great figures I suppose you would say. Yeah, how did the sessions go for that first album? The it's a long, long time ago. But did you have a clear idea of what you wanted to achieve? Nah, not really. I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, Leslie, God bless him, was was uh, a, a really important uh, person in the band in terms of the direction. I think. Um, yeah, I, you know, you just go in because you see that was our first, what the first time that I mean, that's when I started writing lyrics for songs was in that band, and. Um, uh, you you just you just pitch in and do what you think you can I suppose. Um, no, I guess Leslie was more um, had more of a, an idea about. I mean, you know, I'm just a drummer, I hit the pots and pans, and that's it. <laughs> you know, but um, no, as far as how they went, I suppose we we got the record out, so I suppose it went all right. You know. You were an incredibly busy touring band, weren't you, at that time? Yeah, yeah, well, yes, we were, we, we yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a shame, we never really captured on record what we could do in terms of, uh, of uh, playing live. We, we, I don't think we sold huge amounts of records, we did sell a lot of records, and we, we always had great attendances wherever we played. The people always enjoyed and uh, would come and see us time and time again. I mean, even, I mean, even now people come up, can you sign this album, and, you know. Yeah. yeah. Do you think Stone the Crows ever recovered from the death of, of Les Harvey? No, nah, not really. I mean, we went on for a further year, um, but uh, no, Leslie was a very important part of that. I mean, you know, after a, you know, a couple of months, you just have to get on with it, you know. I mean, I can, rem I can remember, you know, like coming back from, from Swansea the next morning, I was going like, not the fact that, you know, Leslie's dead, it was, mm, what's going to happen to me now? It's kind of strange, you know, that that that, that but, but that's it, you know. It, being a muso is a pretty dodgy way of going about things, anyway. So, so um, no, I, I honestly don't. Uh, in, in many respects, no. Um, you know, we did some albums, and we still carried on playing, and things were going okay. But, but uh, no, Leslie was a very important part of that band. Uh, we recovered, but um, something was missing. What made him a great guitarist? Did he? Probably the fact that it was Alex Harvey's brother. Um, you know, if you've got somebody in the family who who, who was a good musician and uh, as as Alex was, um, you know, it's going to rub off on you. You know, I mean, I was listening to rhythms because my sister was playing uh, Paul Anker's Little Darling or whatever. Then you know, you, you, you know, you become involved in music through different ways, but I. I think uh, if somebody in the family is playing music, I've always been incredibly jealous of any musician whose parents were, were, were musicians, you know? Because they were, they probably started playing and being interested earlier, which is always a good point. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a whole other thing if, if you've got people in the family involved. Now, if, if Peter Green had joined the band, ah. <laughs> do you think that possibly that would have taken the band on another step? Oh yeah, I mean Peter had such a great reputation then. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't. Uh, he didn't have all the oars in the water, as it were. He was still playing great though, at the rehearsals. I thought, and because you know, I was seeing things in this incredibly like fabulous 
oh, Leslie's dead, but this will be the rebirth of Peter Green. You know, it was that. That's how I was thinking of it. But um, yeah, it probably would have been. But he, I mean, he said at the time, he said, "No, I can't continue because I think this band's really going to go on and do something." And, and he, he just wasn't ready for that kind of thing. I mean, I, I played with Peter recently. He now lives in the south of south of Sweden. Would you believe? He lives in the, yeah, and all he wants to do is go fishing. You know, so I, I've worked with Peter about two or three times over the last couple of years. You know, but I mean, he, lovely guy, um, but because of his problems, uh, you know, it does affect him in some ways. You know, so he's just a longevity.